Well, first I'd like to start off with a few bits of gratitude. California Southern, as you've already heard, is celebrating its 40th anniversary, and that couldn't be possible without Dr. Donald Heck, the founder of this institution. Without his vision, we really wouldn't be sitting here today. A big thank you to Dr. Gwen Feinstone, university president, and all the deans, faculty, and distinguished guests of this institution. For many of us, our families have played a huge supportive role during our recent academic endeavors. For those loved ones and family members today in the audience, a big thank you for putting up with us during our late nights, stressed out moments, and time away from you in order to study and achieve our goals. I'm sure I share everyone's sentiments today when I say we are happy to have completed this journey and appreciate you for your support. I have to say writing a keynote speech for the graduates today was a tough task. I think teeing it up in an LPGA major and ripping my first drive down the middle of the fairway with TV cameras and fans surrounding the fairway, it's quite a bit easier than selecting the right words to inspire such already accomplished individuals. When honored with the task to address the graduates today, I began the process much like many of my fellow doctoral students approached writing their next paper. Brainstorm the topic, mentally lay out the beginning, the middle, the end, assess page length, utilize reference point software so all citations are properly in APA format, and then Google. So because there was no syllabus for this assignment of creating a commencement speech, I resorted to Google. What did I look up? How to write a commencement speech? How to inspire graduates? Do's and don'ts for keynote speaking? And lastly, how many words fulfill a 10-minute speech? My next resort, YouTube. Watching several past California Southern University student keynote speakers and several other famous speeches by Bill Gates, Condoleezza Rice, and a very funny Ellen DeGeneres, I figured I had done enough research to begin my writing. Does this sound like an all too familiar process, my fellow graduates? How else did we finish writing all those papers and doctoral projects? Yet when it was time to begin writing those first few words, I was stuck. So. What do we do when we have writer's block? I think I'll go make a cup of coffee. 10 minutes later, three laps around the house, I figure I'll do some light stretching, maybe get the blood pumping. Feeling a bit uh, invigorated, and I start heading to the office, but I get derailed because the cat is sitting there and she looks so cute with her belly out, so definitely have to reward that. You just can't pass up that opportunity finally get back to the office and I get settled in. I think to myself, here we go. I can do this. I can be original. Notice the use of those positive self statements. It's those cognitive behavioral therapy skills on point. So I check a few emails, take a brief peek at Facebook and Instagram, maybe send out some snaps, and finally I am ready. Anyone else relate to this beginning paper writing process? I'm sure you do. Well, no matter how many past speeches I consulted or how many articles I read, how to figure out to do this right, it ultimately came down to facilitating the creation of my own original ideas. Ironically, similar feedback I received in one of my early doctoral classes. See, one of the main skills that I fine-tuned during my time in the doctoral program was learning new information, then taking that knowledge and forming new and original ideas. And wow, that can really be hard. The university and its programs, they're more than just read, digest, and regurgitate. It's deeper than that. And I realized when trying to attempt to write this speech, I was really stuck in the cerebral aspects of the task and I needed to get deeper into the heart. The value of this university's education offered to its students, it's more than just cerebral. The mentors, the support staff, and the leaders, students strive to get that knowledge, create it, make it original, and do something new. For you graduates today, the value of this education is unquantifiable because you will continue to utilize what you have learned in your respective specialties and you'll formulate new paths new ideas, new businesses, new innovations, and so on. 
The value of this education to me sets me apart from 29,000 other PGA golf professionals and 1,400 LPGA teaching and club professionals. It positions me in a way that I can say there is no other individual on the globe that has my unique credentials and education combinations. I don't think I would have been able to achieve the task of earning a doctoral degree without Cal Southern's unique accredited online program. My lifestyle is on the go, full of travel, and I have very, very busy commitments to the PGA and the LPGA. Many of you in this room have similar busy lifestyles with work, family, personal interests, and other obligations. Being able to conduct the studies at my own pace, on my own time, was paramount to my success. So I've compiled a list of a few important life lessons that I've learned these past three years being a student. 10 page papers, double space in APA format with a minimum of 10 peer reviewed sources. No problem. Give me a day and I can crank it out. Mastering the art of said 10 page paper on a 17.1 inch Southwest airline seat requires a slight hinge in the elbow with a little flexion in the wrist, neatly tucked by the ribs to make sure that your drink doesn't fall off the tray table. Friday nights and Saturday nights are the best nights for writing papers because everybody else is cutting loose and having fun, so the house is pretty quiet. Bring your work with you everywhere because every free second can be used to read an extra page in a textbook, edit a paper before submission, or send an email to IT because you struggle with handbrake and can't condense the video file to upload to live text. Lastly, probably the most important, save everything, then back up everything you save, then make a backup to the backup of everything you save, then put an extra copy on the cloud just to be safe. All of us are in a unique group right now. A most recent U.S. Census estimated 21% of the U.S. population has bachelor's degrees, 9.3% has master's degrees, and 2% have doctoral degrees. Worldwide, less than 1% of the population has earned a doctoral degree. Now, that statistic is very important to me. Looking back at the early stages of my professional golf playing and teaching career, I remember hearing at an education conference the importance of being unique and standing out. It was shared that in order to be successful in the golf industry, you have to do something different in order to be recognized. The speaker mentioned looking at the golf industry as a pyramid of success, similar to Maslow's hierarchy of needs. The majority of individuals feel very comfortable hanging out at the bottom of the pyramid. They fit in, they go with the status quo, and they get by. But at the very top of the pyramid, well, that's the top 5%. And the top 5% are those individuals who do stand out. Coincidentally, there's also plenty of room at the top, because frankly, the bottom is quite full. The speaker challenged us to take inventory of our life and see what we can do to move into that top. Challenge accepted. I instantly began to pull away from the masses. As I was inspired, I became the first PGA Master Professional and the youngest. Second, I became the first PGA Master Professional licensed to practice psychotherapy. Third, the first PGA Master Professional licensed in psychotherapy to have a doctorate degree. And lastly, as of three weeks ago, the first PGA Master Professional licensed to practice psychotherapy with a doctorate degree and become a dual LPGA Master Professional all the while competing and performing in tournaments. Because let's be honest, thank you. Golfers are nuts. They're really crazy. So it definitely makes sense to have a degree in clinical psychology. Not only to help myself, but to help other golfers avoid mental meltdowns. However, the inspiration to pursue this entirely crazy path came from failure. First attempt in learning. That's what FAIL stands for to me. Failure is a gift. Now, it's a gift that oftentimes explodes in your face when you open it, 
but it's a gift nonetheless. See, the thing about failure is the massive amount of learning that can take place if you let it. As many times as I fell, I made sure to always fall forward. Challenged with adversity, making huge mistakes and regretting them, I learned how to be better at keeping moving forward. A better person, a better golfer, a better therapist. So in my climb to the top, falling multiple times, I decided to take that five percent category and create my own category of uniqueness, a category of one. And in an industry as tough as golf, dominated by men, where less than one percent of the world's population plays professionally, I have positioned myself unlike no other and Cal Southern and the education I have gained has been an instrumental part of that. So I now pass the baton on to you. What can you do to embrace failure, to fall forward, and separate yourselves even more than you already have in order to achieve greatness. So graduates of 2018, be proud of yourselves for positioning you to be unique, original, full of excellence, and in the top. We all went through late nights of writing and studying, countless pots of coffee, tears, time away from our families, missed social gatherings, all to submit assignments and accomplish our dreams. To separate ourselves from everyone else and get out in front of the pack, it takes courage. I congratulate all of you on your hard work as you have climbed to the top of this peak, and I'm honored to be celebrating in this moment with you today. Best wishes to each and every one of you as you continue to strive to reach your goals, and I'll see you at the top. Thank you.